Hello, my name's Rob, and today I'm going to talk about a 2019 paper called Graph WaveNet for Deep Spatial Temporal Graph Modeling. Graph WaveNet is a type of graph neural network, and specifically it's called a spatial temporal graph neural network. And so uh, what does that mean? In the most general sense, graph neural networks are concerned with the same kinds of problems as traditional neural networks and convolutional neural networks in that they take in some sort of input and they use that input to produce a prediction or a classification. And what separates graph neural networks from other architectures is the structure of the inputs that are put into the model. So in a traditional neural network, we see that there's no real structure to the inputs. Each node is uh, fully connected to the nodes of the next layer, but in the inputs themselves, there's no connections between the nodes. Like we could shuffle around these nodes and uh, to the model, it would make uh, no difference whatsoever. With the convolutional neural network, we impose an underlying structure to our inputs. And so that structure tells our model about the spatial relationships between our nodes in Euclidean space. And um, so, for example, this node here is now aware that these nodes are next to it. And we leverage this information to do things like apply convolution filters to groups of pixels that are close together. And this allows us to extract spatial features that our traditional neural network just was unable to identify because it had no concept of the spatial relationships between the, uh, the nodes. And then finally, in, uh, in a graph neural network, we're allowed to impose any sort of arbitrary structure that we want onto our nodes. Graph neural networks aim to leverage complex relationships in the same way as convolutional neural networks leverage distance in Euclidean space. We notice then that convolutional neural networks are, is just a special case of a graph neural network with a specific type of uh, relationship between nodes. And traditional neural networks are also special cases of a, a graph neural network where there just aren't any connections between the nodes. We define a graph using a set of nodes and edges, a weighted adjacency matrix, which describes the relationships between nodes, and a set of node features, which describe the individual node properties. A typical problem that we would be concerned with is using some known input information to predict some unknown node features. And in the case of a spatial temporal graph, we are also given node features from previous time steps and typically asked to predict node features at future time steps given this information. So here's an example. We have a set of speed sensors that are set up along major roads in a city. And our goal is to use the speed sensor data from the past to predict traffic speed in the near future. Modeling this problem as a GNN, we have a node for each sensor and edges representing the roads that connect sensors. And we have an adjacency matrix that contains the Euclidean distances between any two sensors on the map. And our node features are simply the speed and velocity readings from the sensors at any given time. And note here that the only thing that changes with time is the node features. And this makes sense because the distance between sensors is static. This is actually the problem that Graph WaveNet attempts to solve in this paper. And the input described previously is the exact input that is used by the model. So let's dive into how Graph WaveNet actually works in practice. Here is a bird's eye view of the entire Graph WaveNet model. And this will look pretty familiar if you have some experience with the original WaveNet model. And otherwise, it will probably not make much sense at all. Again, here's what a single input looks like for our model. We have a set of nodes and edges, an adjacency matrix, and a set of time series data for our node features. During the first phase of the model, we're only concerned with capturing temporal dependencies, so we're only really going to be working with our time series data. And from this point on, we will consider this time series data as just an n by s by d tensor where n is the number of nodes, s is the number of time steps, and d is the number of node features, which in our case is 2, speed and velocity. But uh, the model is built to handle any uh, value for d. I also want to note here that even though I've made everything look pretty small, there are likely hundreds of nodes in our model and tens of thousands of time steps. So we're not actually into the model yet. Uh, this little part down here is a pre-processing step. 
The first part of the model is going to look for temporal dependencies using an approach called one-dimensional dilated causal convolutions. And this pre-processing step is just to get the data in a form that's ready for that. So what's shown here is a typical one-dimensional convolution filter going over a single channel with a three-dimensional filter. Note that we are only moving across the time dimension and that each time produces a single output. Also, I just want to note that I've shown the output as a little node, but each one of these nodes is actually another n-dimensional vector. There are a couple of problems with this for our model. First, notice that uh, each time step convolves over one step in the past and one in the future. Because the whole point of our model is to predict future time steps, we obviously don't have the luxury of looking one time step into the future. To fix this, we use a causal convolution filter, which only looks at past elements. A second problem is that because our filter extends back two time steps, our output is two elements shorter than our input. To fix this, we simply pad our input with enough zero vectors to ensure our input and output dimensions match. Just to reiterate, each one of these nodes is an n-dimensional vector, so the output of this filter will be n by s. So this pre-processing step first pads all our channels to allow for causal convolutions, and then applies a two-dimensional convolution layer with a one-by-one -one kernel to create 32 channels with identical dimensions. Note that we haven't started applying any causal convolutions yet. We're just pre-processing our input data to get our input into a format that our network expects. Specifically, it just pads the inputs and it generates 32 channels. Now that we've completed our pre-processing, we begin our first hidden layer. So the 32 features we just generated are going to be duplicated into three copies. The first two are going to be fed into separate temporal convolution layers, and the third is going to be safer later. The temporal convolution layers are going to apply our causal convolutions and produce another 32 channels of output. Notice here that uh, after applying the temporal convolutions, our temporal dimension has decreased in size. We eventually want to reduce this dimension down to a single dimension uh, corresponding to a single prediction, and this is where dilations come in handy. We can see that these small reductions in the temporal dimension are going to take a long time to whittle down to a single prediction. And further, if we try to use less layers, say just the prediction from the fourth hidden layer, then we notice that this prediction's receptive field doesn't include all of the original inputs. To solve this problem, we introduce the concept of dilation. Dilation specifies a number of nodes that we would like to skip when performing our convolutions. And by increasing the dilation as we get deeper into the network, we see that we need far fewer layers to produce an output whose receptive field covers the entire input space. So using our dilated convolutions, the reduction in our temporal dimension in each hidden layer is now a function of both our layer's dilation and the kernel size. We're still only in the first hidden layer, and as we move to lower layers, the rate at which the temporal dimension decreases in size will increase exponentially. We then apply TANH activation to one of our outputs, and we apply sigmoid to the other. And then we apply element-wise multiplication between the two. Recall that the sigmoid function squishes our elements to a value between 1 and 0, so this step is using the output from the sigmoid layer to potentially weaken some of the outputs from the TANH layer. This technique is called gating. We create two copies of the gated temporal features, passing one to a final output queue, which we'll talk about later, and passing the other to our graph convolution layer that will identify spatial dependencies. So note up to this point, we've only been dealing with our node feature data over time and not our adjacency matrix or our nodes and edges. This is just the structure of the model. First, we extract temporal features at each of our time steps and we now iterate through each time step individually to discover spatial features. Notice here that when finding these spatial features, the GCN is not going to change the dimensions of our data at all. It's just going to apply a transformation. This transformation is called diffusion convolution. So our graph convolution network, or GCN, first picks a fixed time step, and from that time step retrieves the corresponding n by 32 feature matrix. Also recall that we have our nodes, edges, and our n by n adjacency matrix.
So for the moment, we forget about the rest of the time steps and focus only on our graph structure, our adjacency matrix A, and our current node features Y. In a 2016 paper by Kipf and Welling, we were introduced to an efficient method for retrieving features from graph data based on 2D convolutions. This method derives our features Z by matrix multiplying our Y matrix by a set of learned weights W, and then matrix multiplying the result by a normalized version of our adjacency matrix A. In our traffic speed sensor problem, we notice that our adjacency matrix A does not really provide us with all the information that we need. Recall that the entries in A are the Euclidean distances between uh, the speed sensors on our graph. Notice that two roads may be close spatially, but not necessarily busy at the same times. Or consider a single edge between two nodes. The road has the same distance both ways, but the traffic speed might not necessarily be the same in both directions. GraphWaveNet's solution to this problem is to consider traffic data as a diffusion process. It can be shown that this function here represents the stationary distribution of a k-step walk with restart over our graph if we were to let k go to infinity. In practice, we choose some finite k and use this as an approximation for the transition matrix of the diffusion process modeled over this graph. In a random walk, the transition matrix is a matrix where the element in the i-th row and the j-th column corresponds to the likelihood of getting from node i to node j on a random walk of length k over our graph starting at the i-th node. This function approximates the transition matrix and is a more realistic representation of the spatial relationships in our graph. We also account for the possibility of having different traffic speeds in different directions by defining a second term. This term is an approximation for the stationary distribution of our transition matrix moving in the opposite direction. We combine these terms by adding them together. Finally, we introduce an adaptive adjacency matrix term. Our uh, P forward and P backward matrices were derived directly from our adjacency matrix, but what if there are hidden relationships between nodes that we are unaware of? This third and final term is designed to learn these dependencies as the model trains. To create this term, we define two n-row matrices with initially random values, E1 and E2, and we apply ReLU to their matrix product to get rid of weak connections, and we apply softmax to normalize the uh, entries in the matrix. Alternatively, we cannot use any of the diffusion stuff that we just talked about and simply have our model use the learned adjacency matrix. Uh, this would be helpful in the event that we have no idea what to put in our adjacency matrix. Our GCM will repeat that process a whole bunch of times across all possible time steps to produce our Z-tensor. Recall now that we had saved a copy of our original input for this hidden layer for later. We now add that copy to our final outputs to get the final final output for this hidden layer. This process of adding our unchanged input to the output is called a residual skip connection and it was used by the ResNet architecture to avoid the vanishing gradient problem and to build deeper networks. Notice here that the temporal dimensions of these tensors don't match because our TCM reduced the temporal dimension of our Z outputs earlier in the layer. To deal with this, we simply use the most recent time steps from our original X inputs and discard any earlier time steps that aren't present in our Z outputs. And that's the end of the first hidden layer. The X2s shown here will be used as input for the next hidden layer, and this process will repeat itself until our temporal dimension has been reduced to a single element. Recall now that as we went along, each time our TCNs produced an output, we stored a copy of that output in an output queue. Our final entry into this queue will be a tensor with only a single time step, and we now add the last time step from every other tensor in the queue to our final tensor. And finally, we apply ReLU and then apply a convolution with a one by one kernel. We apply ReLU again and apply one final convolution uh, in a similar fashion to the original WaveNet model. And then the uh, result from that final convolution is our model's output. So how effective is Graph WaveNet in practice? We have two different benchmark data sets and six different models to compare Graph WaveNet against and we have three different metrics that we use to evaluate model effectiveness and we'll also test our predictions after 15, 30, and 60 minutes.
we can see that graph wave net outperforms all the other models across all experiments. Interestingly, the model outperforms the original wave net model with predictions that are as accurate at 60 minutes into the future as the original wave net was at 30 minutes. This seems to indicate that the authors were indeed able to leverage the graph format of the data to improve performance. And that's it.